I'm actually going to do a real quick brush over on pairing, di pairing DB. Um, for those that don't know, it's a community sponsored effort that sp has a database of peering points that networks gather at and lots of people use it for automation. We just recently created our own independent nonprofit to fund it and use it. So where are we at? If you use peering DB, if you don't use peering DB and you peer, I suggest you do. If you use peering DB and have spare time or money, we would like some of it or both. We're 100% volunteer run, so we have an admin committee that takes care of all tickets. And we have a product development committee. We're just starting to deal with new features. And both are looking for volunteers, if you have time, like I said. And here's the sponsorship info. And we would like to. We'd like to thank our sponsors. And there's been a lot of people that have stepped up and given us money and time already, so congratulations to them. And if you have any questions, now's the time to ask, otherwise I'm gonna cruise on to the next talk. That's gonna be quick and easy. All right, so network automation. Lots of people have done talks on this. Lots of people are probably starting to do this and in asking people, specifically at the last Nanog, did a coding buff and asked, and a good 90% of the people said that they would really like to start doing automation, but they don't know where to start. So the, the, the point of this talk is kind of get aside of, or skip aside all the complexities and just do a real basic, simple, this is how you can start doing this, play around with it. We're gonna ignore lots of important things, so don't necessarily take this and do it on your production network, but maybe take this home and play around with it someplace. And I'm more than happy to answer questions during the talk, so if anybody has questions, just shout it out and I'll stop and discuss a little more. The way most people automate nowadays is all homebrew tools, so it's little scripts that do different things. I personally have a soft ground, software background, so I don't necessarily like how it's done, but networks are so different that I think it's really hard to do anything but that. So the way I've done it, and I've automated three networks in the last year, I think, besides the United IX one. And I've reused little scripts and snippets, but pretty much start from scratch every time I go into a new network, start from scratch. Or reuse as much as I can and kind of work from there. Which brings me to the Unix philosophy. And people that are familiar with Unix know that almost everything in Unix is a text file. There are lots and lots of programs that operate on text files and it all kind of works together. And the same philosophy works very well with network automation. So every little thing you do, make it a, its own separate thing. There's three basic parts to automation, data, whether it's your customer database, whether it's peering database, whether it's an IR someplace, there's a logic, there's where you take that data and actually apply it to what I'm gonna do on the device, and then there's the deployment section, which takes what you just did and actually physically puts it on the device. <clears throat> and I see people do this, what I consider wrong all the time. They try to combine too many steps in one thing. Keep it very separate, keep it very small. If you're getting the data, just get the data. Don't do anything but read the data, verify that it's correct, and then write it. If you're building a config the same way. Take what you're doing, make it small, and move on. Push into a device. It should have nothing but taking a text file and putting it on a device. Any other logic belongs in a different step. I'm sorry, what was that? You're talking about the state of the device when you push the config to it? Or you're talking about like a BGP session being up? Uh, multiple, multiple questions sort of cascade. All right. Right. 
I consider that as pushing to the device. So, and this completely ignores what the current state is. So if you're pushing a new config to a device in like a new BGP session, you don't necessarily care whether it's up or down. You just care that the config gets there. I would consider that more operational on what happens after that. Does that answer your question? So anyway, when you do this and you make everything as a little tiny piece that can all be put together, everything's concise. I mean, you might have 50 scripts that get run when you go to provision a new customer, but each one might be 10 lines of code. So it's very easy to edit it, modify it, test it, and unit testing is hugely important. And I said I'm gonna skip testing, but I keep coming back to testing because it is very important which is another thing from the Unix philosophy. Do one thing and do it well. When you make scripts small and tiny like that and just do one thing, like I just said, it's 10 lines of code. You can look at it and see exactly what's going on. You don't have to wonder about what different inputs are, what's going on. Do it all and test it, which is, and I had to throw a system D dig in here because system D is kind of going backwards on that where it's one big monolithic cluster that touches everything. That's not how you should do this. Another tenet in the Unix philosophy is streaming. So you can take the output of one program and put it right into another program, which is very useful for Unix. It's not necessarily useful for network. Instead, I kind of look at it as write out to a database, like a YAML file or something, and then you can read it from something else. So it's the same, same basic philosophy, but not quite the same as it works on the Unix command line. <clears throat> I have a few examples here I wanted to go over. So BGPQ3 is a very useful program for querying IRRs for things like prefix lists. It has several options that will directly output config. I think that just makes everything overly complicated. I use BGPQ3 all the time. Output to JSON, I actually convert it to YAML in most of my cases and write another file with that. So then you can take that data and you can use it to do like an export filter in BGP. You might use the same thing as a access list on a customer port to stop them from spoofing. You use the data multiple times. You just really want to get it once and you want to have it local and know what you have. You don't want to query the IR every time you use something like that. Exactly the same with peering DB. If you're on a internet exchange, You'll have, probably have a list of ASs that you peer with. You'll probably query peering DB to get like max prefix, neighbor IP, things like that. You take it, if you make one tiny little program that takes it from there and outputs to a local file, you're converting the data to the data that, to a format that you can use. You're not dependent on peering DB being up or down. You might want to push a config change and peering DB is down. And even if your config change had nothing to do with peering, all of a sudden you're hung on waiting for peering DB. And specifically with peering DB, we'll never change the API, but if it does change, it's really not that big of a deal if you have a 10 line script that just goes to peering DB and gets a few fields. It's really easy for you to modify and change. And then as a more abstract example, if you get to the point where you're not touching devices real time anymore and you have some sort of customer database, follow the same rules. Add a customer to the database. Don't have a huge convoluted script that adds a customer and tries to provision it at the same time. Just add the customer to the database, run your provisioning scripts or whatever scripts you run, and anything else can use that. <clears throat> So the way you take the data and go from raw data to making it something useful is templating. There's other ways to do it. I've tried unsuccessfully to really make them work, and I think templating is one of the only ways that is actually useful in this day and age. And I just threw a quick example up here for those of you that don't know templating. It's really just as simple as picture your config, and where something's different, you do a variable on it. And the same thing I've been preaching all along is true with configs. Don't try to write one big config file. 
every little different thing that you have should just write its own little snippet of a config. And this is obviously um, Juniper specific, but it really works with anything. So don't try to do that. Little tiny scripts, write little config snippets, push them. You can then use any tool you want. So you could do a one-off, let's say, or PeeringDB is a good example. You can have all internal stuff, but you have one script that when you peer, you want to go get max prefix list from PeeringDB. You can have one little script that does that. You can also just do manual config files. There's lots of cases where you start automating a network that you run into an area that probably isn't that easy to automate, automate or generate. And instead of fighting that, just do a, do a manual one-off. It's not that big of a deal. And then when your deployment push config is one little script, all it does is take a text file and put it on a device. That device could be Cisco, could be Juniper, could be Arista, could be anything. It's got one little job to do. And going back to the one-offs, lots of people will do things like if hostname equals X in a config file in a template. That just makes a spaghetti mess in our array. You're much better off just having, an, like in this example, an extra config directory with a host name. So any file, when it goes to push it, it says, oh, I'll look for this file named after the host name and pushes it. And as I've said multiple times, when you do everything as a tiny little piece, it's very, very easy to test. Every single script you have takes input, produces output at some level. You can verify data, you can validate the data, you write it. You take the data, build a config, that's easy. You can throw generic data at it and test it. Push to a device, you really just have to test I.O. and that the device accepts the config. And then if you have a bunch of different devices in your network, you can have the same script, one that talks to Juniper, one that talks to Cisco, et cetera. All works perfectly. When you deploy, and this is another area that lots of people do things what I would consider wrong, always test it. Always test to a deploy, a dev machine. If you want to set up a virtual network, that's even better. Don't push to everything at once. Don't do things like the magic. If I commit to this git branch, it runs a few unit tests and then magically pushes to my network, which lots and lots of people do. You have absolutely no control over that. So when that passes the test and pushes to your network, nobody's physically watching it happen. So if something breaks, you have to wait for you to get paged. If something doesn't break, you really don't have a fine grain time control of what happens. Like Puppet, for example, runs every 30 minutes. If I make system changes, I don't want them to run the next 30 minute tick that it goes. I want to either run them now or run them later. I don't want to just have them sitting out there waiting. And you definitely should version your config, should log everything you do. Every time in the networks that I automate, when changes get pushed, it first grabs the current config, it takes a diff, and it logs that. Because if I push a, push a config change and I watch it happen, if something breaks, I want to know what it was like before that and what went wrong. So you can never really log too much. And this should go without saying, but so many people still use passwords. There is no reason to use your name and passwords. There really isn't. 20-year-old gear supports public key auth. Use that. You don't have to worry about somebody getting the username and password. When a change happens, it's personalized to that user. So my username is different than somebody else's username. We're not just logging in and using root with the username and password or anything like that. So there's really, in my opinion, there's two very separate automation environments. There's the engineer-controlled network, which probably almost any network could fall under. Engineers buy new gear, provision it, store the data however you want it, push it. I use Ansible a lot. You can use Puppet, Chef, custom scripts even. And then there's the customer-controlled, where the customer logs in to a website and does something, and when they click submit, it modifies the network. 
when you use the small pieces like that, you can reuse the same thing over and over for different environments. And I use our, the um, Chicago IX layer two ACLs. When we get a new customer on, one of the engineers will provision the customer. Part of that will do what this is called is build ACL config and a tiny little script that pushes the ACL. And in fact, and you can read, read over this, each one of these bullet points is another little small piece of reusable code. But essentially what it does is it takes the customer, we do MAC address locking, so it looks up what the customer's MAC address is, it looks at what their black hole list is, new customer obviously would have an empty black hole list, and then it builds the config and then it pushes the config. Actually, that's what I just went over. Also, if a customer router dies at 2 a.m. and they put in a new line card and all of a sudden their MAC address changed, that means they will not pass traffic. But if they log into the portal, they change their MAC address, click submit, it writes to the database. That database write then triggers the same exact script, push ACL. It rebuilds the ACL and pushes it to all devices the customer's on. Exactly the same as if they tag a route with a BGP community. We use Bird for route servers. Bird will take that, see that it's a black hole community, call a script that just adds the black hole to the database, calls the exact same command that pushes out, rebuilds the echo on every switch that that customer pertains to. So this is just a just brief example that I threw together that shows that when you use small little things, you can start doing something and maybe not even realize where you're gonna need it, but when you do need it someplace else, it's very easy to use it. So one of the things that I wrote that I actually just committed this morning and probably isn't really ready for release, but I've used same software over and over, like I said, and I've started grouping this together and kind of separating into parts. So Engage just takes a config or a group of configs and atomically pushes it to a device. And you see the different commands, commit, diff, push, We use SSH key auth everywhere. Obviously, when you get a new device, it's not set up. Some people use the like DHCP initial deploy stuff. I personally don't think it's worthwhile just because you don't have that happen so much. So when we get a brand new server or a brand new switch and plug it in, I'll run a command similar to this. If the auth fails, it prompts for a password. So the first time you push, you log in as root, you give it a password. Then it magically pushes all the user configs with SSH keys and you can go from there. Just out of order. <clears throat> I have a bunch of helper scripts I use that, like this is a diff script. Sometimes when you do some config changes, you like to run a command that generates the config and then push them to a device and see what, what different, what changed. Script for that. You might have a group of servers. So I do a bunch of changes for BGP. I just want to push it to the edge routers. I purposely left this functionality out of Engage and just do shell script wrappers in kind of the same spirit of do one little thing. You can script around it so easily. So the easiest way, if you still have a network where you're you log into a device and do changes. Create a git repo, git repo, get a copy of your config, rancid, engage, we'll save a copy of the config. Get a copy of your config, commit it, and you should be good. You can change the file and run like this engage command to see the differences you made. And honestly, you're pretty much done there. If you wanna just stop there, you're light years beyond where you were if you had people logging into devices and manually configuring it. Obviously, there's lots of places to go from there, but this is still a really simple, like literally a few minutes it takes you to do this, and you can stop touching devices directly. You have a somewhat good change log. Obviously, you can push config changes that aren't committed, so it's not perfect, but it's certainly better than not having anything at all. You can use your text editor to do changes. I mean, there's just, 
there's really no reason for people to ever directly log into devices anymore. And then I just threw together a couple of examples. I was going to try to do a, like a start from scratch and completely automate your device, and it really didn't, I didn't think it went into slides well, so I just, this morning I literally just grabbed some stuff and copied and pasted into this. This is an Ansible config, but you can see that there is an array of customer ports. Name it, you put the customer ID in, VLAN ID, prefix, and the access switch. And you can see the switch is egg zero, port, second port, third port. On the access switch, this is a config snippet, loops through all the customer ports, it checks if the host name is the, the access switch, meaning is that customer plugged into the switch? If so, it provisions the switch with the VLAN. We also have all access switches have a link back to the core, which is the, the main part of the network, let's say. So if you look back here, this is, almost violates logic and templates, except that the, the switch has to know what it's, what it's making. So you can see the do cust VLANs made append. That's saying that every switch knows which ports that it has on it, and it makes a list of them. It then takes that list of ports and adds that as trunks back to the core. The edge router then will make a VLAN. It then will loop through the customer ports again, make a prefix list based on the prefixes. This also has BGP Q3, so if they're a BGP customer, this will go out to an IRR, query what their prefix list is, and combine that in and then build this list. It then uses the same prefix list to make a firewall filter. <clears throat> Adds the port, another one-off. If it's a slash 31, you take the network address. If not, you take the first address, so then it builds your layer three interface on your router for that. If you have VRRP, it will do the same thing. It will build it all, put it together, and go. And then BGP, it will build the neighbor list for you, it will do all the policies, and go from there. So that was just a quick example of how you can take what was literally eight, nine lines of config, nine lines of, I should say, data, and it will build your config across your network to do that. I think I did a quick job there. Any questions? So you think that using Ansible is a better solution than something like Puppet? I personally like Ansible a lot more because it's a lot more open, it's agentless. Puppet, and I've used Puppet in very big deploys, and I haven't got along with it well. I'm also a Python guy, not a Ruby guy, so I mean, there's some bias there, but the whole system of, with Puppet, you have a device that just pulls every X amount of minutes and then sucks the changes in, whereas with Ansible, it pushes to the device when you're ready to push, and I think that's a lot better method. So wh where in your uh, deployment model would you put in kind of some sanity checks, like that a VLAN is unused when somebody pr picks it, or is unused when you want to deploy it, or somebody else didn't grab the port when no one was looking at that? Is that a deploy time exercise that you would have to build scripts into? Is that a build the script exercise? Kind of when do you put that? I, I would put that in everywhere. Like I said, I purposely left out the testing, but in your example, like if you were going to add a VLAN, when you add the VLAN, you would check to see if it's used. And when you're actually deploying, you might check and see if it's used. So it's and really... I mean, you can never test too often, I guess I should say. And then following your model, I would, I would basically create a set of reusable, is this VLAN in use, and then just constantly reuse that script at various steps of the process, right. rather than trying to build it into the push script and the it, validate script. And the, exactly, yeah. Okay. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, <clears throat> what sort of approach would you recommend? Um, is it better to do add, replace, or uh, wipe and reconfig? Like when you're, when you're dealing with changes, like uh, so you're provisioning a new VLAN, you need to add it to all trunks. Do you completely reconfig the port or you just attempt to add the VLAN to the trunk? In, in most cases, I mean, I'll, I'll use replace wherever I can, but 
obviously that doesn't work in everywhere, and that's a big problem too, is when you're taking stuff away. So if you take a customer away, you run into that problem completely. And all I've done so far is scripts that kind of analyze and try to clean up data, because I don't necessarily know that there's a great solution for that, but I guess I'm not even really answering your question. I try to do replace, I add on where I have to, right? Do, do tools like NetConf and, and YAML and Yang actually have the ability to, to tell it to just remove this config if it finds it, or, is, or are they more built just towards pushing additions and pushing complete reconfigs? They're really just built for pushing additions. You can cheat, at least with Juniper and NetConf. You can do a replace colon and then uh, empty braces, or close braces, and it'll delete the config for you. And do you have any recommendations for people that have to deal with um, uh, a router management that does not have a commit operation. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Well, I hope it wasn't lightning. Thank you.